Hi, and welcome to this week's Property Insider video. Today, in my chat with Dr. Andrew Wilson, we discuss what's happening to our economy and our property markets, but you'll be interested in Dr. Wilson's predictions of what's going to happen to property values for the rest of this year. He's going to give us some forecasts, and he's also going to give you his thoughts about what's going to happen to inflation and what that means for interest rates. So if you want to keep up to date with what's happening in our property markets, why not subscribe to this YouTube channel so you get our weekly show and click the little bell icon so YouTube notifies you each time a new show comes out. Well, we're a third of the way through the year and Australia's house prices have continued to surge strongly in April, albeit at a slower rate than the blistering pace in March. And while auction clearance rates have dropped just a little bit, they're still at boom time levels. But what's happened to our rental markets? We know they've been lagging behind house price growth. So to answer that question, Dr. Andrew Wilson is going to be giving us the findings of his latest National Home Rental Market Report. Now, on the economic front, every level of government and the Reserve Bank, they've been doing all they could to support our economy. With our federal budget coming out next week, there's already lots of speculation about what's ahead. But no one's really expecting any major announcements that will affect our property markets. However, the latest finance figures suggest our budget deficit will be about $30 billion smaller than expected. So that should make it easier for Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, who's confirmed that he's going to retain his focus on supporting our economy, getting more people into jobs, promoting higher wages, and only then he's going to address the higher debt levels of the government. Now, this makes sense considering the government's borrowing costs and interest payments are so cheap. Remember, they're much, much cheaper than the rate you and I pay. So I'm looking forward to this week's Property Insider chat about our housing markets and the economy with Dr. Andrew Wilson, Chief Economist of My Housing Market. Hello, Andrew. Yeah, good morning, Michael. It's uh, yeah, coming up to budget time. Very interesting, as it always is. And uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of giveaways as usual. And I think the Treasurer will be focusing on that. Well, I guess as usual, jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, let's get that unemployment rate down. Well, that's what their focus is. And we'll have a bit of a talk about that in a moment. But let's start with our property markets. And yes, auction clearance rates yes. were a little bit lower this week. But last week, you pointed out they've gone from white hot to red hot. They're still yes. at boom time levels, Andrew. I think it's somewhere in between white and red, Michael. So I don't know what that is. Is that pink? We had the resumption of the market last weekend, Michael. Of course, we had a, a whole month of holidays, starting with Easter school holidays and then Anzac Day. And that always acts to sideline buyers and sellers, uh, distracts them, and it did. And we saw clearance rates easing over the month. And, of course, volumes were also easing over the month. And no surprise, but uh, no excuses last Saturday. Uh, numbers were up, strong numbers in Sydney, reasonably strong in Melbourne. And, look, Brisbane numbers have been low this year, but clearance rates have been high. Maybe there's a reason for that relationship, which is obvious. But <clears throat> there were strong numbers in Adelaide, and uh, Canberra was a little down. But clearance rates really didn't shift that much. They were, again, in the mid-80s in Sydney. They were above 80% for the first time in a month in Melbourne and strong again in the other capitals, a little lower in Brisbane. But there's nothing really to read in those results that would indicate a significant downward trend in activity. The levels we've had above 90% in Sydney are unsustainable. Even if you had that same sort of buyer energy, sellers would tend to start looking at the greed factor and pass their auction properties in rather than sell them under the hammer. And, and that can occur and perhaps it's occurring now. But, you know, also we saw a shift downwards in prices, auction prices over the month. Again, it's because we typically see a lower proportion of higher priced properties in the market during holiday periods. And of course, that acts to pull down the median house price. So we really couldn't read anything into those declines in median auction prices over the month of April. But we are now into May, of course, Michael. This is the end of the autumn selling season. We'll run up to the Queen's birthday weekend and then it all starts to ease until we get to that July hiatus in the market. But certainly I would expect market conditions still to strongly favour sellers, prices to continue to rise. The latest monthly median house price data that has been released did show an easing in prices growth but it's still strong. It's still tracking at double figure rates. It's moved from those previous months and the previous quarter results, which were 
were clearly quite remarkable. And we hadn't seen those sort of numbers in Sydney anyway since 1989. But again, we don't have anything to continue to fuel this growth at the moment. It's catch up energy. We are catching up. We will catch up soon, Michael, and then it'll all start to ease. But certainly still a uh, the prospect of maybe even another 10% prices growth in this uh, for the remainder of the year. But I'd su- suggest it might even be a, a little bit lower than that in Sydney and Melbourne. But no doubt, we're still in the middle of the upswing and certainly a long way to go before we start calling the markets flattening. Sure. But while house prices have gone up, Rentals have languished, particularly in the high-rise towers in yes. particularly Melbourne and Sydney, but you regularly look at the rental markets yes. and bring out a monthly rental market report. What have you found happening, Andrew? Well, interesting, some trends are now emerging in the rental market, Michael. We are starting to see a significant easing in vacancies in those inner-city Melbourne and Sydney unit rental markets. Rental, the trend for those markets is now in terms of vacancies and vacancy rates is down. There's been a sharp decline in vacancy rates for units in Melbourne and Sydney over April and still quite high. Let's let's not sort of gild the lily too much. Numbers are still uh, high in terms of the historical comparisons, but there has been a sharp shift downwards in those unit markets, Michael. And Melbourne and Sydney unit vacancy rates are clearly higher than any of the other capitals. But I think what we're seeing now is with borders opening up, we're seeing an increase in holiday or demand for shorter term holiday and business accommodation. And that is taking the Airbnb factor out of the permanent rental market in those areas. It is certainly noticeable that the Airbnb side of the equation has improved significantly over the past month. It was a holiday month. Yes, of course. So we would have seen that. But I think we are seeing Airbnb landlords now moving back into shorter term accommodation which is taking some of the supply out of those inner city markets, Michael. And I think that trend will likely continue. Vacancy rates are still high. There's still downward pressure on rents in those areas. But I think we're now starting to see a stabilisation of the market. And there are other factors which will act to increase demand, I think, generally for rental properties, Michael. And just before I mention that, we've got to take note that it is a two-paced rental market that houses are really in short supply now, rental houses across the board. It's really only Sydney and Melbourne that have vacancy rates that you consider to be in a reasonable realm, Sydney at 2%. But Melbourne's, all the rest are well below that. In fact, we have to call housing shortages everywhere except Melbourne and Sydney, and that'll mean higher rents in those other capitals. But in Sydney, vacancy rates for houses at 2%, there was a slight falling away of rents over April, over the month in Sydney. But Melbourne is going the other way, Michael, which I think is very interesting. We're seeing an upward trend in vacancy rates for houses in Melbourne, and it has the highest vacancy rates for houses. And we actually saw a fall in rents over the year for houses as well in Melbourne, Michael. And I think there's a bit of the COVID migrant issue there that's taking demand out of the house rental market in Melbourne. We know there's a lot of evidence and growing evidence that there's a shift out of Melbourne, particularly into South East Queensland, And I think that that's impacting the rental market by uh, reducing demand for rental properties there, despite, I guess, the the balancing factor of, and that's why we're seeing, we know, to some degree, more demand for houses is that people are looking for larger outer suburban properties, the work from home, they need some office space, they don't have to commute anymore, so they can move to the outer suburbs without that commute, get a bigger property, perhaps a cheaper property. So that's part of what's driving demand for houses. There's some other factors as well, and that is that we've underbuilt over the last four years. So a new supply coming through is languishing. And of course, the other factor on the supply side, Michael, is fewer investors. We've got very low numbers of investors still in the marketplace, and that means that new supply is not coming through of that investor stock, of course, which is fundamental to the rental market. The other point is, Michael, I think that we're likely to continue to see tight rental markets and upward pressure on rents, particularly in houses, is that we're going to see the end of the first home buyer cycle. I think we'll see fewer first home buyers. We're seeing some indications of that now as they are priced out of the marketplace. So first home buyers don't have the capacity to keep up with higher prices because they don't have a trading. So eventually they get eased out of the marketplace. And of course, those incentives that first home buyers had are also now diminishing or have extinguished. 
So that's going to mean more demand for rental properties, Michael, with fewer first home buyers in the market. So higher demand and lower supply means that we're going to see, and that demand is also in the holiday market, the, the short term market uh, sphere as well, means that we will start to or increase the pressure downwards on vacancy rates and upwards on rentals. Well, we spoke about the budget a moment ago as well, and that's coming up next week. And with Australia's labour market's strong rebound, the federal government now expects that the final cost of JobKeeper was nothing like what they initially suggested. And that means that there's going to be a little bit less of a deficit. The government's figures show that more than 90,000 people have come off welfare since JobKeeper ended in March. So we haven't fallen off that uh, cliff. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg said ending the scheme was actually the right decision. And as I mentioned earlier on, he's keen to keep uh, pushing to get jobs going and grease the wheels of the economy rather than worrying about their debt. The interesting thing we've also seen over the last week is personal credit growth wasn't as high as maybe people expected. We've been stashing our cash credit growth slumped uh, to an extremely low 1% over the last year, Andrew. Yes, look, uh, we still are moving ahead in a, in a very positive fashion in all our sort of macroeconomic positions, Michael. It's unknown territory to a large degree going forward, but certainly Australia's position continues to improve. With, we're hearing less and less, of course, of the, the cliff, the big bogey that was supposed to hit our economy and our housing markets after the end of JobKeeper in March just hasn't happened. We've had one set of figures, OK, that doesn't mean it's the end of the story, but we certainly will await the April numbers when they come out in terms of the reflected impact on the end of JobKeeper on the labour market. And gee, we wouldn't be surprised if there was no impact at all. And those that have got onto the bandwagon of the cliff will be heading for the hills as usual. We saw a sort of similar scenario last week, Michael. We had, of course, the official CPI numbers out for the March quarter, which were quite interesting. And there was a lot of speculation that with the end of a lot of the support packages that have kept prices low, particularly in terms of building and childminding, that we would see a, an increase in the inflation rate. And of course, the slightest whiff of an increase in the inflation rate would have, has, has all the, the, I suppose, the bears running out talking about higher interest rates. And I couldn't believe, well, I could believe really, that it was all this speculation prior to the release of the CPI data that it would, it would signal higher interest rates, which is just cloud cuckoo land stuff, Michael, complete fruit loop stuff to be speculating on that based on the CPI data lifting marginally. But as things turn out, again, those pundits looking for higher interest rates as a cheap story were proven to be absolutely wrong. Inflation came in at a very low 0.6 of a percent and well below the 1.1% quarterly growth that was predicted by the market. Now, having said all that, the, the prospects are certainly for higher inflation over the coming quarters. We will see pressure on building costs in terms of all that building that will commence as a result of the home builder scheme that will put upward pressure on building costs. We're already seeing a shift to higher rents. Of course, house prices are rising as well. And a lot of those support packages that kept prices down last year for consumers will uh, have now reversed. So we will see higher inflation coming through, Michael, over the next coming quarters as we readjust to a more normal economy. And we will get the usual great cheap headlines that this means higher interest rates sooner rather than later. We'll have a good laugh about that one and just mark time between those predictions and when it actually does happen, if it does happen, to once again realise that we couldn't be further away from higher interest rates regardless of an inflationary adjustment. But just to sort of put a dampener on all that, the underlying inflation rate Michael, which takes out all the volatility in prices growth, was at a record low level of 1.1%. So uh, underlying inflation, if anything, is actually falling. And that measures the real inflation rate, I guess you could call it, in the economy. But get ready for higher inflation. It has to happen over the next couple of quarters, but it will be an adjustment from the subdued inflationary numbers of the past year, which were a result of all those government support packages. Well, some interesting things to look forward to. And when we chat next week, we'll have some information about the budget. Yes, but sure. I can't imagine there's going to be any major changes no. to the property market. The government would be really happy with the wealth effect and the increased consumer confidence our property markets are bringing. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. I think the property market's done its job in a sense. We've got first home buyers. We've got 
buyers generally up and running again, exceptions still investors, but first home buyers have taken up with the lack of activity from investors. These are record levels of owner occupier uh, activity in the market. And that does, as you said, create the wealth effect, a lot of downstream economic consequences. And of course, the building industry is up and running again. And we're seeing some capital cities having good old fashioned building booms, particularly Perth, as a result of those government stimulus packages, the home builder package particularly. And first home buyers have had a good run also over the past 12 months particularly, and they've been part of the improvement story. But as you suggest, Michael, I would that there'd be nothing really in this specifically for the housing market. It's just about getting our unemployment rate down. So infrastructure projects, these sort of bits and pieces, perhaps some incentives for business in terms of tax relief to encourage them to hire and targeted uh, policies at particular industries. So uh, we look forward to it as usual, Michael, and there'll be, as usual, the leaks that will occur <laughs> prior to it. We'll be able to discuss that next week. We'll know it all. Thanks for your time, Andrew. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.